There are many different ways that people love to travel by RV. Some are all about the adventure, while others just want to get away for some peace and quiet. Many RVers are on a mission to check off places to visit and enjoy the amenities of an RV park. And a lot of us dabble in all these styles of RVing. But in our experience, the longer someone travels by RV, the more they might enjoy being off grid. Kind of feels like you're winning. You're winning. You're, you're beating, winning. you're beating the elements. You're looking at the Tetons and you're like, I see you out in the middle of nowhere and I still get a warm shower. There are a lot of terms for being off grid, such as dry camping, when you're not hooked up to the water and off in power, or boondocking, if you happen to be dry camping in the boonies. And then there's mooch docking, if you're mooching just a little bit of power from your friends and family. If you're just getting started, it can be a bit confusing to know what runs when you're plugged in and what doesn't. Why does your phone charge through the USB cable, but your laptop doesn't? And if you have a small inverter, why can you charge your laptop, but you can't turn on your coffee maker? So in this episode, Mark is gonna talk about solar, a term he uses loosely. And when I say solar, I put it in quotes like solar, because really that's become the universal word for not only solar, but also uh, batteries, lithium batteries, inverters, pretty much all the things that you need to RV off grid and away from shore power. And so in this video, and we've done several solar videos from the reflection that we had, to the momentum, even the teardrop and the Airstream of which we've actually had two different installs that I wanna walk through on this video. But for this, for this particular episode, which has been highly requested and long overdue, uh, I wanted to chat about some of the uh, details or nuances of, of RVing off grid and how to really make the most of a solar system. If you're new to RVing, where should you start with that? I wanted to talk about some of the limitations there are to dry camping and if you even like it. So we definitely have, Trish and I both have um, some tips and some advice if you're just getting into it. Uh, and then I also wanna go through the Airstream and actually do kind of a walkthrough of our system because a lot of people have been requesting that. There's some really cool things like how we fit a thousand watts of solar panels on top of a 30 foot RV. And then we've got some of our favorite tools for dry camping um, that we'll talk about at the end of the video. So uh, like I said, this has been highly requested and we've got a lot to cover in this video. Uh, if you if you prefer the travel videos, you don't have to wait too much longer. We're about to hit the road. Um, but I think this is gonna be good for those that like to camp off grid because we have a lot of stuff to share. So Hey there, um, we're Harvest Host members and we're about a half hour away. We're wondering if we could stay with you tonight. You're welcome to pull in and stay behind the hangers there. Not... When it comes to talking about off grid systems, the first question you need to ask yourself is, do you even like dry camping? It's time for a small confession. For a long time, I really didn't like visiting national parks. I know, we just finished our National Park Blitz, and if you missed that series, we'll link the playlist here. It's a pretty good season, but if you want the cliff notes, you can watch our National Park Recap episode. Now, back to not liking dry camping. Let me explain. No hookups means it can be harder to cook, something that I do often. This is unbelievable. Is there a we're, tiny spot? we're like that? Yeah. eating out in the middle of nowhere, or we're eating like gourmet foods. Yeah. When these ladies prepared by these ladies with love and tenderness. <laughs> <laughs> and it's certainly harder to clean, and conserving resources with a family can be challenging. Not to mention the dirt. Charlie, I'm looking at you. But as our family continues to leave the nest and our RVs got smaller, maybe a little too small. Because already we have learned a lot. <laughs> Is there more you'd like to say? I'm ready to cheers again. <laughs> and then just the right size with our 30 foot flying cloud airstream we were able to fit into more state and national parks. But more importantly, we got better at dry camping. We enjoyed the solitude and we managed our resources smarter and we didn't need as much. Surprisingly now, it's what I enjoy the most about RVing, besides finding farmer's markets, great restaurants and charming towns. We all RV for different reasons. But if you're new to RVing, you might be wondering, what do you really need to get started dry camping? Nothing. You don't need anything. Your RV is equipped with one or two lead acid batteries and likely not an inverter, unless if it's either an Airstream or a big class A, then I'll have it, possibly it'll come equipped with, a, with an inverter. But if you have one or two lead acid batteries, those batteries will provide all the 12 volt power that you need to run all the systems in your RV. And when I say systems, I mean it'll power your tongue jack if it's a total RV. It'll power your water heater and your thermostat, all the LED lights in your RV, the power awning, all the stuff that you need 
to function. So you're completely good to go dry camping with your brand new RV without any solar system whatsoever, as long as you're comfortable reading a book and enjoying nature. The moment that you wanna actually do something and live normally, the moment you wanna turn on the TV, or you wanna charge a laptop, or you wanna use your coffee maker, that's where the solar systems and all the conversation about power starts to come into play. So if we look at, if we look at dry camping, off-grid camping as a continuum, and we have reading a book and enjoying nature here, and living normal, like as if you're in an RV park, but you're really out in the middle of nowhere, that's over here, and this is the continuum, the, the cost difference between this and this is probably about $20,000 or more. And so then you have to ask yourself, what kind of RV experience do you want off-grid? Are, are you interested in just spending a night or two at a Harvest Host and you're comfortable reading a book and maybe you could charge a laptop and run the coffee maker for one morning? Or do you want to live as if you're at an RV park but you're not? And these are questions that you can ask yourself. But I personally think it's a very wise decision if you have a new RV to use it for a little bit and to camp and to really get a sense for how do you like to camp what 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 style do you like? How long do you like being off grid? And and really understanding what your limitations are, your personal limitations and the RV's limitations, before you invest in a big solar or even a small solar system. So for instance, and we're going to talk a bit about generators, but if you have a generator to run your air conditioning or you have a residential refrigerator, the question would be: Let's say in the course of a year, how often are you running that generator? If the generator is running all the time, that's a great indicator that it's probably worth the investment of starting to look into a battery bank and a solar system and, and inverters. But if you find yourself hardly ever running the generator, that's a great clue that maybe you're not gonna get the most value out of investing in a solar system. Do so you have butterflies in my stomach? Got her all loaded up there. Nice. The last day you're gonna have ginger. Yes. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> Good. All right. How great to see you. You too. Another big factor to consider before investing in a solar system is making sure you're going to keep the RV you have. If you're just getting started, it's not uncommon to make a couple changes before you find the RV that's most suitable for you. Or maybe like us, your family is changing and you know you'll be buying a new yeah. RV soon. Okay, bye. <laughs> Today you gotta push him out the door. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Although a solar system does add value to your RV, especially with lithium batteries because of their three to 5,000 charge cycles, and the battery bank and solar doesn't appreciate as much as you think, it still might reduce your potential buyers to people that value dry camping and would have invested in a solar system themselves. These are all things to consider before jumping in. But before we get into the amps and watts, it's important to first understand how solar works. You might be wondering, what can I really run off solar? Nothing. Nothing runs off of solar. The only function that solar provides is to recharge your batteries. The sun comes into the panel, it goes directly into your batteries. The purpose of your batteries is to provide all the power for your 12 volt system inside your coach, your RV. The moment that you want to run the microwave, run an appliance, a device, coffee maker, hair dryer, TV, or anything that you want to plug into an outlet, that's when you need AC power. And to do that, you'll need an inverter so that you can convert the power from DC battery to AC power. Now, how big of an inverter you need depends entirely upon what devices you'd like to use when you're off grid. If you want to use the microwave and the coffee maker, hair dryer, anything with a heating element, that's going to draw more amperage and so you'll need a bigger inverter. Or if you want to use two appliances at the same time, that would also require a bigger inverter. Now the size of your battery bank, that depends on how long do you want to run these devices before you run out of power and how much solar you need depends entirely on how fast do you want to recharge your batteries so that you be, you can become sustainable. So you probably, you might have heard of a term called solar math. This is you trying to figure out how much power are you going to consume in a 24 hour period and therefore how much solar battery bank do you need so that you can be replenished to be completely sustainable. And ultimately it's going to come down to, in my opinion, making some sacrifices. How do you want to live off grid so that you can weigh 
your budget and your needs and find that happy balance. Personally, I feel like a generator can save you thousands of dollars because and from my perspective, a solar system that's gonna cover about 80% of your needs is gonna have the most value in your system and then let the generator cover that last 20%. The last 20% of a solar system is the most expensive. And so if you don't mind turning on the generator to run your air conditioning or to recharge you a little bit faster from time to time, you're gonna stretch out that budget a lot further. But there's a lot of people that dry camp so much, they say, hey, look, I don't care, I just wanna, I wanna, I wanna camp where I wanna camp, I wanna have access to the power I need and be off grid, and I don't wanna hear a generator. And I can appreciate that. And if you have the budget for it, then I'll power it to you. Now the only drawback to any of these systems, no matter how big or small, is if it rains. Dense here. Let me let me back up the window. How's it look? Oh, look at those. It. They're huge. Look at this. Dude, look at this. How hard it, it rains a lot everywhere, and when you're traveling, it seems to rain even more. And for that, DC to DC charging, and we've already covered what DC stands for. So DC power, meaning coming from your alternator in the truck, sending power, DC power back to the RV to charge the batteries directly from the truck to the trailer when you're hooked up and driving has been a really good advantage when it comes to your, your battery solar system because of how much it rains. What will end up happening is Trish and I will go dry camping for a couple days and then the rain will come in and then we'll, we'll, we'll get back on the road and if we don't have DC to DC charging and it's not sunny, uh, the solar isn't working and we've depleted our batteries and so therefore we're forced to go into an RV park to replenish before we continue to camp. And sometimes that's just not how our schedule is, is working out where we actually planned, like Merle Fest last year, we were there for a week dry camping with our generator and solar and then we uh, discovered that morning that we needed to wake up, leave Merle Fest, travel down by the Blue Ridge Highway, Parkway, excuse me, and go into the Smoky Mountains at Elkmont Campground, of which had no hookups, and it was raining. And so uh, DC to DC charging has provided another advantage for us because it means that if we're gonna be driving for most of the day, we can almost completely replenish our batteries while driving, which has been awesome. Okay, so how does DC to DC charging actually work? What, what Victron component are you adding? We're gonna use an Orion uh, TR Smart uh, DC DC okay. 12 to 12 controller. And, and where does that actually go? The controller is actually on your... Oh, it's uh, on the Airstream. It's on your Airstream right oh. now. So we're basically gonna be running wires from your uh, DC system all the mm -hmm. way back, making a connector at the back of your truck to plug into... Just an Anderson connector? So just an Anderson out. connector hanging out, like you had asked. And then, okay. um, essentially, anytime that it's active, it's gonna be convert, you know, taking a 12 volt out input in and then outputting 12 volt at a charging parameters that's best for the batteries, right? And a little bit different than what was previously there, which yeah. was essentially a switch yeah. that just said latch and unlatch. Gotcha. So we're talking 30 amp DC going back. Correct. And the amount of amperage, like 20, 30, 40, that just depends on the Victron Orion module. Like cool. you can get a bigger one or a smaller one? Correct, you can do, well, they make uh, 20 amps and 30 amps. Mm -hmm. uh, we use a single 30, typically we would do uh, if you had a larger system, uh, we would do 230s and you'd do 16 in total. All right, so. cool. Now, is that only available? I mean, you could, we did it on the F450 and I didn't have the bigger alternator. I think I had two batteries, but I didn't have the bigger alternator. Yep. Or a second alternator, I can't remember. Correct, yeah. But this one does, I think, right? This one has, you have, yeah, you have some a secondary alternator, so you're definitely gonna have some extra power on your auxiliary system to mm. feed back to that DC. Okay, that was Josh with Future Solutions out of Elkhart, Indiana. And FSI, Future Solutions, they did the solar install of our momentum, of the bird, and of the Airstream. So if you're looking for a highly capable group of individuals to help you through the install, a very professional install, I only have good things to say about FSI. And they were kind enough to include the schematic of the entire Airstream install right here. So if you want kind of the technical uh, view of what we did here on the Airstream, I'm gonna overlay it right here. On that note, I need to have a conversation with the solar techies.
I'm gonna speak Italian to Mike. Go ahead. Now, you really should not be watching a video like this because this is an introductory to solar conversation, but I know you're watching anyway. Now, when you're looking at this schematic, you might be wondering, why do they use a BGA when they have the Multi Plus 2? And why do they have a bypass shutoff switch over here and there's a good reason for that. When we initially did this install, it was a couple years ago, and the Multi Plus 2 didn't come out yet. In fact, the Battleborn Game Changer 3, the GC3, that had not come out yet either. So we initially had the Victron 3000 watt inverter, and what FSI did is they ended up kind of creating a switch so that I can make both legs one and two hot. Then, the Multi 2 came out, Multi Plus 2, and so we, we retrofitted the system to incorporate the Multi Plus 2. Uh, and the BGA, which is kind of a device to help protect your batteries when they get low, um, was being kind of a nuisance to me because every once in a while I, I would run my batteries down a little too low and it would trigger the BGA. And when I was connected to shore power, I wanted to have the ability to bypass the BGA. So FSI accommodated that for me. But this is technology that you would not necessarily have to do because it's native to the systems in the Multi Plus 2. Okay, back to English. So the Airstream is equipped with six Battleborn batteries, each 100 amp hours. So that's 600 amp hours. I've got a couple uh, Victron uh, solar controllers that are both MPPT, and then I have um, a bunch of other blue boxes that I intentionally like to take for granted. And then this right here gives us kind of a, a access into what's going on within the system, which by the way, if you don't have the GX50, you could easily just use your phone and access all the same information. This just makes it very convenient to get to. So here I can look at what's coming in off the grid, like what's coming in off shore power, the status of the inverter, what my AC loads are, my DC loads, what's coming in off of the roof, the solar, and then the current status of the battery in terms of percentage and watts. Now in here, I can change the status of the inverter to like charge only, on, off. I can even set a current limiter, which I'm gonna talk about. But this does that even better, I think, because it tells me exactly what I'm at. Like right now, we're connected to shore power at 50 amps, so I have it set to 50. But let's say I were to go to a state park that only, only had 30 amp power, which happens all the time. So we would come in and I would grab my adapter to move from 50 amp to 30 amp, and I would plug in and then I might find that I had the breaker pop on the panel. Well, that's because this is a 50 amp coach. The inverter is a 50 amp system. So if I don't reduce the power that it's trying to get to 29, if I'm connected to 30, then the breaker pops. So I have to lower this to 29. And the reason that I like the uh, multi-control is that I can easily do that and I can easily see exactly where I am when I'm walking by. Because what will inevitably happen, uh, unless if you're really good with checklists, is you'll leave that state park and then you go to an RV park where you have 50 amp, but I'll forget to go back up to 50. And then um, I won't be able to draw 50. So like I'll be able to run one AC but I'll get an air on my other AC and I'll think, what's going on here? And then I'll remember, oh, I didn't, I didn't go back up to 50. So I just like that this is uh, always available for me to see. Um, plus it makes it very easy for me to switch from charge only, off and on. You know, you'll notice that it's in charge only and we're connected to 50 amp shore power right now. So when you're connected to shore power, I can leave it in charge only because all the power coming in is from shore power. When I disconnect from shore power, uh, again, if you're really good with a checklist, this doesn't apply to you. But if you're not so good with a checklist, I'm not going to name any names. Um, I might be. I might leave the air conditioning on. I might leave the uh, electric side of the water heater on. We're going to cover this in a little bit. But the water heater, let's say that pulls 1,800 watts. If you leave 1,800 watts on as you're driving down the road, you're only going to get a couple hours down the road, and you're going to find out you have really low batteries. So by leaving this in charge only, it it eliminates the possibility of drawing AC power as I'm driving. And then when I get to the state park, and let's say there's no pedestal, there's no shore power, uh, and I wanna run appliances, I just go from charge only to on. What am I gonna do when you go to school? Who's gonna get all this stuff for me then? I don't know. Maybe you'll have to do a bigger bed slide. <laughs> you heard Mark say that you don't need anything to get started with dry camping, and that's true. But if you find yourself enjoying being off grid and you want to do it more, there's a few things we've found to make it a bit easier. 
here's some helpful gear that you might like. The thing we use almost every time we go dry camping, or the most frequently, is the five gallon water jug. I can't tell you how many times Caleb and I use this, and so we leave this full in the back of the truck. And uh, when we run out of water, I'm like, oh, phew, I got five gallons. Well, and we're out of water right now. Well, I have five gallons in the back of the truck. Is that water, is there water in there? Yep. How much? And I'll typically send Caleb in the back of the truck to go get this. And then in some cases, like when we we're in the Smokies, uh, in a state park that you don't have water in your site, Caleb and I will take m multiple trips to go get water. The drawback is, as you probably know, five times eight, 40 pounds, and it gets kind of heavy. These things are heavy. You know that little pump that Ken Dog had? Yeah. It's in our cart. Oh, good. Because then it would be inside this, and then I would have the tube going into the tank. Just turn it on. <laughs> I call that the flamingo. <laughs> Kenny Brooks showed me this tool right here about dry camping. This is like a transfer pump. And so all you have to do is, I think this takes like a, a big big D battery, and you put this in your freshwater tank, you drop this in your, your jug, you hit the button like this, and it'll literally just put the water right into your freshwater tank. Here's a pro tip. Don't lose that little cap, or it loses all of its ability to suction. Hence, the new one I had to buy. Another pro tip. If you got two of these, then the other one could be used for gasoline, it could be used for maybe your black tank, if you had any issues like of that nature, you didn't want to have to, you know where I'm going with that. Maybe having a couple of these isn't such a bad idea. Now let's talk about generators. You heard me say before, if you can build a battery bank or a solar system to cover 80% of your needs, and then have the generator cover the last 20, you could save a lot of money on your build. When it comes to running your air conditioning on your RV, a generator is probably the way to go. The reality of having a battery bank that you can run your AC is that Trish and I end up using our battery bank to run the AC for about an hour if we were to have lunch on the side of the road or if we wanted to go into a town and leave Charlie in the rig for an hour. The idea that we would be running the AC for hours on end is a bit of a misnomer because uh, we would need to have a little battery left over for all the things that we need to do that night. Turn on the air conditioning real quick. Yeah, sure. What are we at? 100% battery. That's zone two. All right, we're on the side of the road and we got the air conditioning going. And this is really probably one of the main applications of having a battery bank and an inverter that can run the AC is when you're driving, you're gonna pull over for a little lunch. It's sunny, so you're bringing in solar off of the roof and we got DC to DC charging coming off of the truck. So whatever we draw right now for a half hour, an hour, we can replenish before we get there. The reality is you're just kind of always preserving the power you have. And so if you want to run your AC, it's best to have a generator. Now, if you want to just dip your toe in dry camping and you know go to a harvest host or dry camp for a single night, I think this is the way to go. This is the Southwire portable power station. This is the 500 series, which is kind of their middle of the road. They have kind of like an 1100, and then they have an entry model like 200. But this right here, as you can see with the AC plugs, this will charge your laptop. It's got USBs to charge your phone. It's even got this for whatever you need. It's got a light. And uh, this right here will, you know what? It'll even charge your CPAP machine. So if you wanted a dry camp, but you have a CPAP machine, and you don't know how you can like avoid running a generator, this will even run that. So I think this is the best way to just get started with dry camping uh, and being able to charge your computer, which is all we wanted when we first started. We wanted to just be off grid and just charge the things that were important to us. You're not gonna, I don't think you're not gonna run your TV off of this and things like this, but it's gonna charge all your personal devices and allow you to um, be off grid for a night, maybe two. Now this you can get from Techno RV. In fact, if you go to technorv.com slash KYD, we put all of our favorite Techno RV products on that single page, and there's a 5% um, discount promo code on that page. Okay, we've talked about this a whole bunch, like a whole bunch. When Trish posts on Instagram, people say, you talk about this a lot. But there might be new people here, and I can't do a video on dry camping products without talking about um, our coffee system. Because we've had different products like French presses, and the problem with a French press is that you're, you're left with all those grounds, and it's kind of messy. Whereas this, we can use a paper filter, we can use our propane, to heat up water and then we let me show you here even though i have some b-roll and then we just simply pour this over the grounds and we put the thermos on and we're good to go it's like 
35 bucks or under $40 on Amazon. Okay, last product. I came across this last season and I bought one off their website. And then I reached out to the company and I said, hey, I really like this. Do you have a promo code for our community? And, and they did. So uh, in the link below, I'll include any promo codes. But this is the, I think it's called the Devos Light. And it's got this super long pole. So I can bring it way up top. And what's cool about this is that when we're out around the fire and that kind of stuff, the light is up above and it's shining down. But because, as you can see by the design, it's shining down on our campsite. So it's not bothering anyone around us but it's providing light from up above. This thing has been awesome. So we're, we're digging this light uh, and then subsequently from making videos, I love having this big tripod. So that's it. Those are the products that we've found to be helpful while dry camping and convenient and fun. Trish, you got anything to add? <laughs> I think you did a great job. <laughs>